So our next presenter is uh, Daniel Benya, who is pursuing his doctoral degree at the University of Alberta under Dr. Michael Hendry's supervision, focusing on evaluating the impact of dynamic loads and track characterization on rail brakes. He has more than seven years of academic experience as a university lecturer and research associate on data mining and rock mechanics. Daniel is also the author of a and co-author of more than 20 publications with over 100 citations and has published a book on geotechnical instrumentation and monitoring. Welcome, Daniel. Yep, thank you, thank you, Kevin. Thanks, thank you very much for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for all of you being here and following my presentation. It's an honor to have the opportunity to address such a distinguished audience. Today, uh, I will talk about one of the essential aspects of railway engineering, which is vital from different perspectives, like ray breaks, railway design, and selection of rail estate and cross sections. As you can see on the screen, our topic is proposed dynamic load factors developed from instrumented preset measurements. As shown in figure one, which is based on the rail occurrence database system or ROTS dataset, there was an overall decreasing trend in the number and intensity of main track derailments between 2001 and 2014. After further analysis of the ROTS datasets to evaluate the frequency of the different causes of derailments and the severity of the resulting incidents, the most common and severe derailments causes resulted from ray breaks, track geometry, and environmental conditions. And the other important factor for the severity was derailment velocity. And our past research conducted at the Canadian Rail Research Laboratory has shown that the failure of rail and rail components is the most frequent cause of derailments and results in the most severe derailments assessed by frequency and severity. The main justification for this study is that ray breaks are too common and there is little known about the track and loading conditions that result in ray breaks, the current understanding of the magnitude of dynamic loads and relation to track structures from available literature is lacking. And the main objective of this study was to quantify the dynamic loading conditions on current class one freight railways and the factors that affect the magnitude of that loading. As you know, a clear understanding of the nature of these loads provides opportunity to make design improvements. This paper is part of a larger research program that aims to develop relationships between dynamic loading, track modulus, and other track data to locations at which ray breaks have occurred or the ray defects have been found and removed from service. A limitation of the existing dynamic load factor equations is that they have been derived from measured dynamic loads from a small instrumented section of the track, like through the wayside method or like wheel impact load detectors methods. These methods have their pros and cons, like considering a variety of, of uh, cars and nominal loads. From the cons perspective, the instrumented section is a kind of well-maintained track that cannot represent the actual real condition of the track over longer routes. The data, the data sets used for this analysis were obtained during 2015 as a part of a joint University of Alberta, Canadian National Railway, and the National Research Council of Canada. Yeah, let's move on to the data collection method in this study, which is called Instrumented Wheelset System, or IWS. Those photos show the instrumented ray car with IWS and m ray measurement system used for this study. The IWS data collection system was mounted on a 52 feet gondola car over two class F build plates with a diameter of 36 inches. And the car was loaded with gravel to a total weight of 11.75 kilonewtons. And the IWS has comprises 16 full bridge Wheatstone strain gate circuits, which interpret forces applied to the wheel from the rail, I mean, between the wheel rail interfaces. And this system 
also provides an appropriate opportunity to revisit the previous dynamic load factor and also assess the dynamic load factor over various track assets and features on a route. And the data used for this research inclusive of four different runs, two different direction, and also over the class one freight railway as a part of a high traffic subdivision with more than 50 gross million ton, ton per year through the Canadian prairies with 340 kilometer lengths and over the continuously welded rail supported primarily by concrete time. And also the recording date was between July and August 2015. Yeah, let's move on to the results section. Since we have four rounds, the first step is defined as the repeatability analysis of the data. Figure seven shows example data sets from four passes of the same size. The middle figure is related to two eastbound uh, trains with a slower speed, and the bottom one is for two westbound with higher speed. Especially the bottom figure for higher speeds showed remarkable repeatability in dynamic load measurements. And now, so we can say that the IWS data set are repeatable. The next step, we analyze the statistical distributions of the various uh, Various uh, track features, including tangent track, grade crossings, switches, uh, curve sections, and bridges. As the graph indicates, the mean and median values are very close to a static load. The results are normally distributed, with tangent tracks have the narrowest distribution, while other track assets have wider and very similar distribution. So we consider two, di we consider two different data groups based on these results, including tangent track and non-tangent track. Next step, we evaluated the available data sets regarding different aspects, including, first of all, two main lines, I mean comparing lines, which are developed for North American railways, including Arima and Van Dyke at all 2017. Arima line is the most important dynamic load factor for railway design, and also, and, Van Dyke et al. line is the most recent developed one. And the next one is, is considering values, inclusive of maximum values, 99.9 percentile values, and groups test values. And the last considering aspect is track characteristics, including tangent track and non-tangent track. Let's now look at the tangent track figure. The groups test values are more consistent. Because of that, we consider these values for the fitting line. And Arima gives the same values for the dynamic load factor at the tangent track when train speeds over 60 km per hour, but clearly underestimate dynamic load factor for lower speed. As I have already explained, the non-tangent track includes curve sections, bridges, grade crossings, and switches. Again, in the non-tangent track, the graphs test values are more consistent. The top figure shows that the, the other attempts to develop dynamic load factor, I mean Arima and Van Dyke et al., from instrumented sites significant, significantly underestimate the dynamic load factor for the non-tangent track. As an alternative and arguably more useful presentation of dynamic load factor, the data was reevaluated over the ranges of permissible train speeds within a given class of track. As I pointed out in the previous section and shown in table one, the RMO dynamic load factor gives the same values for speeds over 60 km per hour in tangent track, but for lower speed, the RMO equation underestimates the values. And for the non-tangent track, the RMO dynamic load factor clearly underestimates the dynamic load factor values. Let me sum up our main points. The significant difference of this study from past studies is regarding the data collection method. The previous studies were based on the instrumented section of track, but this study is based on the variation of uh, the magnitude of dynamic load along the different track characteristics. And the IWS data set provide measurements 
of dynamic loads under constant car typing condition, but for the variety of track condition found over 340 kilometers of in-service track. And this study shows that the impact of track conditions is significant, resulting in ranges of dynamic loads, dynamic load factor values that track may experience both above those provided by common means of estimating, especially for non-tangent track. And for future studies, the authors suggest developing ranges of dynamic loads and dynamic load factor values, I mean nominal loads, that incorporate both track conditions and variation in car type and conditions. And at the end, the author would like to thank the Canadian National Railway, National Research Council of Canada, National Science and Engineering Research Council of Canada, and Transport Canada for their support and facilitation of this project specifically Tom Edwards, Ayrza Rogani, and Albert Baba for facilitating the collection of these data sets. This research was made possible through the Canadian Ray Research Laboratory. At the end, I appreciate your time, consideration, and attention. If we have time, I'm happy to answer any question you might have. Perfect, thank you, Daniel. Uh, I don't know if there's any questions that uh, people would like to ask. We got a couple minutes here before our next presentation can start. I could always start out. So uh, you mentioned at the end that there's uh, additional work needed to better develop the dynamic load values that uh, through your research. So do you have any ideas of what type of work that would uh, entail? Yeah, it's uh, as I mentioned for the for the next research, it's better to consider different nominal loads or dynamic loads and also different car time. Those are like because based on the IWS, the car type and condition is like constant. And we can we can change the static load, I mean the nominal load, and we can always a dynamic load factor in another project. Okay, perfect. 